everyone. Welcome to the Radcliffe Institute. Uh, it's great to see so many people out for this event. Uh, my name is Sean O'Donnell. I'm the Associate Director uh, for Academic Ventures. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Academic Ventures is a group on, uh, at Radcliffe that brings together people from across the university uh, to discuss all kinds of issues of importance, to bring people together to discuss ideas from different uh, perspectives, uh, different disciplinary um, perspectives. And it's been my pleasure to, uh, on this particular project to be working with um, Megan Hill from the Honoring uh, Nations Project, and also to be working with Shelley uh, Lowe of the Harvard University uh, Native American Project. And we know we have some really wonderful and important um, topics to address today. This year at the Institute, we've been looking at citizenship um, for this year and for next year. And there are so many ways in which we know that this topic today um, deeply affects notions of citizenship on Native land. Um, I also want to invite you to um, come to Laylee Long Soldier's poetry reading uh, this Thursday. It's also at 415. It'll also be in this room. And uh, also to our gender conference, which is entitled Who Belongs? Global Citizenship in the 21st Century. Um, our keynote speaker for that is Pulitzer Prize winning uh, novelist Jhumpa Lahiri. Um, and uh, we'd love to have you, uh, again, explore the idea of citizenship from many different perspectives. And uh, we know that today's event is uh, promising to do is, um, some really wonderful work in understanding the ways in which uh, the Native, Native American people and tribes and nations are trying to make sense of uh, many of the things that they've inherited in their, in, in their world. So with no further ado, I'm going to bring up Shelley uh, Lowe, who's going to, um, I think, introduce the panelists and get us started. Thanks. Good afternoon, my name is Shelley Lowe. I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation. I am originally from Ganado, Arizona. I am also currently the executive director of the Harvard University Native American Program. I want to acknowledge quickly the Massachusetts people whose land we're on, but also the Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples whose histories are so intimately tied to this institution. Before we get started with introductions, I'm going to ask my colleague Jason Pacano to come up to say a quick blessing for our event today. And we do ask that um, nobody record or take pictures at this time. Thank you, Jason. Um, our panel tonight, or this evening, is part of a conversation based on a recently published book. And unfortunately, I didn't bring my book, but I do know one of our speakers has his book with him. The book is The Great Vanishing Act, Blood Quantum, and the Future of Native Nations. And one of the editors is with us today, Mr. Norbert Hill, and I'm sure he will talk about it a little bit more. I encourage everyone to take a look at the book. It talks about citizenship from various tribal points of view, um, from youth point of view to a tribal point of view to historical points of view. And it's very good and will kind of guide some of our conversation today. So on our panel today, Professor In Bruce Dutu, a uh, member of the United Homa Nation is the Samson Ockham Professor and former chair of the Native American Studies at Dartmouth College. He's an internationally recognized scholar of Native American law and policy. Professor Dutu is the author of Shadow Nations, Tribal Sovereignty and the Limits of Legal Pl Pluralism, published by Oxford University Press, and American Indians and the Law, published by Viking Penguin Press and he was a contributing author of Felix Cohen's Handbook of Federal Indian Law, the leading treatise in the field of federal Indian law. His co-edited special volume of South Atlantic Quarterly, Sovereignty, Indigeneity, and the Law, won the 2011 Council of Editors of Learned Journals Award for Best Special Issue. He has lectured on indigenous rights in various parts of the world, including Russia, China, Bolivia, Italy, France, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Anywhere else? We didn't miss something? <laughs> and he's been teaching a class, or he's taught a class at the Institute for American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, also on the panel is Olivia Hoft, a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, where she was born and raised. She is a contributing author to the book, the anthology, The Great Vanishing Act, Blood Quantum and the Future of Native Nations. And she is former Miss Oneida in 2014-2015. 
She earned her Bachelor of Arts from Stanford University in 2015 and currently works at Google as an Associate Product Marketing Manager in San Francisco, where she is also a lead of the Google American Indian Network. Also on our panel, Teja Zentek. She is a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation. With financial help from a prestigious Gates Millennium Scholarship, she graduated magna cum laude from the University of Notre Dame in 2009 with a Bachelor of Arts in English. After graduation, Teja spent two years teaching and running an after-school program in Puerto Rico before pursuing her passion for education through graduate study. In 2013, she graduated with her Master of Arts in Education Policy from Stanford University. To celebrate her educational achievements, Teja has received the Howard Yekis Memorial Award and the Next Gen 30 Under 30 Award. In October 2015, she became the Citizen Potawatomi Nation's first director for its new education department, which aims to help tribal members identify and reach their educational goals. Since 2012, Teja has also served as Potawatomi Leadership Program Advisor, helping to restructure and implement curriculum for the Harvard Honoring Nations award-winning internship program. And lastly on our panel, Mr. Norbert S. Hill, Jr., a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. Norbert Hill recently retired as the Director of Education and Training for the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. His previous appointment was as Vice President of the College of Monavity Nation for their Green Bay campus. Mr. Hill served as the Executive Director of the American Indian Graduate Center in New Mexico, a nonprofit organization providing funding for American Indians and Alaska Natives to pursue graduate and professional degrees. Previous positions include Executive Director of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, Assistant Dean of Students at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, and the Director of the American Indian Educational Opportunity Program at the University of Colorado Boulder. He founded Winds of Change in the American Indian Graduate Magazine publications of ACES and, a and the American Indian Graduate Center. He holds two honorary doctorates from Clarkson University and Cumberland College. Past board appointments include the Environmental Defense Fund, Chair and Board Member of the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. He is an elected member of the United Nation Trust and Enrollment Committee and currently serves on the boards of St. Norbert College, the Wisconsin Historical Society, and the Green Bay Botanical Garden. In 1989, Mr. Hill was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering. I would like to ask the panelists to please come up. Join us on stage. And to begin our panel tonight, we're going to have Professor Bruce Dutu start us off. Thank you, and thank you, Shelley. Thank you to our native tribal uh, hosts on whose lands we meet, and thank you to the uh, Institute for hosting this event. It's a great pleasure to be back in Cambridge. I feel badly that we're keeping you indoors on such a gorgeous day after the winter we've been through. Um, so, but thank you for indulging us. Um, I'm not going to say too much uh, at this point because um, our panelists are ready to go. Um, I'll have a few things to say. Uh, by way of summation, and then some questions for our panelists before we turn it over um, to you, the audience, to ask questions. So uh, the way that we're going to proceed, each um, panelist will have about 15 minutes, at least that's what I was told that you have, uh, about 15 minutes to share their own comments on the topic for today, and uh, followed by a few questions that I've circulated to them uh, to think about. I probably won't ask all of the questions. I, I went into that professorial mode where you just kind of ask questions ad, ad, ad nauseum. Uh, so I'll try to ask maybe just two or three questions and then just to get them primed for your questions. And then we'll turn it over to you. Um, when it is your turn to, to ask questions, there will be a mic set up right here in the center of the uh, hallway, and we ask that you identify yourself, um, where you're from, and uh, ask a, as brief a question as you can, okay? Thank you very much. So I don't know what order that we have, if you want to go in a particular order. You want to start yeah, us off, Olivia? Right. Thank you. Sorry. 
Sugoli Sogwek, Yago Hahio Niungets, Oneota Agani, Waganyata, Niwigita Loda. Hello, everyone. My name is Olivia Heft. My Oneida name is Yago Hahi, which means her road is good. I'm from the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, and I am Turtle Clan. Uh, first of all, I just want to say how humbled I am to be here and among the amazing company of my fellow panelists, and how grateful I am to the Radcliffe Institute for having us and for carving out space to have such a vital uh, discussion. This is one of the most important questions of our time for Native people, and whatever we decide will lay the foundation for generations to carry on the conversation we are starting today. It is a difficult question to ask, and there sadly is no one right answer that has been hiding in plain sight all along when it comes to blood quantum. What great news that would be, we could all head home early. But to me, it is an inspiring time as well. For so much of our history, we have worked within the definitions of other outside forces of what it means to be Native American. And I believe this is an opportunity to decide for ourselves. My mother, Patty Heft, served on our, our, our elected tribal council for three terms, a total of nine years, following in the footsteps of her mother, my grandmother, Sandra Ninham, who was one of the two women to start a bingo game on our tribe's uh, reservation in the, the 1970s, um, one of the first in the country, which went on to become uh, our tribe's casino as we know it today. My family's legacy of contributing to Oneida's survival has profoundly impacted my Native American identity and sense of citizenship to my tribe. The question of what it means to be Oneida and of what I can do for Oneida's survival is something I have thought about almost every day of my life and has influenced any decision I've made in my life so far, especially when it comes to where I've lived. Tribes are place-based cultures. We are because of where we are. Uh, growing up, the world seemed a little more black and white, that there only was Oneida and the rest of the world was not, not unlike the binary quality of blood quantum itself, which views identity as either or rather than a spectrum. I was born and raised on the Oneida reservation. My mother is Oneida and my father is white. They met and fell in love while working at the local newspaper in Green Bay and had me and my older sister, Lauren. And although my mom had always had dreams of leaving Oneida eventually to pursue different goals she had, she always knew that it was vital to our identities to be raised in Oneida, around Oneidas, so she stayed. Uh, we found out recently that my sister and I are actually the seventh generation matrilineally and the 10th generation patrilineally in our family to be born and raised in Oneida, Wisconsin. That is no small feat. Uh, despite many warring factors and outside influences, since the Oneidas of Wisconsin first left their homelands in New York, and moved to Wisconsin in 1822, all of my ancestors not only survived, but also have made the same choice to stay, generation after generation. And my mother made that choice as well. I also plan to make that choice. When I meet new people and they learn about my connection to Oneida, how it worries me to live away, and how often I try to visit home, or how annoyingly difficult it is to find a nonstop flight to the middle of Wisconsin in the winter, usually the first thing they ask is, do you think you'll ever move back home permanently? which to me is an ironic question because I only ever left because I always knew I would come back home eventually. And moreover, I only was able to leave because I knew I could come back home. Growing up as a young native person, you are, con you are confronted with the idea of long-term goals a little earlier than your peers. I knew as a child that Oneida and many other tribes were in survival mode. I knew that blood quantum would mean something to me when I chose a partner in the future. And I always knew that one day I would come home, that I would return to Oneida, and that that part of my future, I had already decided. Until then, though, I had big dreams of what I wanted to do, the things I wanted to learn, and the skills I hoped to bring back to my tribe one day. This is actually where Norb Hill enters my story. Norb was the director of the Oneida Education Department and was close to my family. We briefly spoke earlier that I think he's known my family for four generations now. Uh, his kids had gone to a boarding school in Rhode Island called St. George's. Hi, Megan. Um, and he put the crazy idea into my mom's head, who then put it into mine, that I should apply. I was scared but intrigued. My mother told me repeatedly, just go. You'll always have a home to come back to. We will hold your place here in Oneida. Boarding schools have a controversial and traumatic history in the Native community, although less well known in mainstream society, in which many Native youths were taken by force or circumstance to attend boarding schools in the US where their hair was cut, their language was forbidden, and education was largely used as a tool of assimilation. This was a radical fork in the road for my life and for my family, both in how out of left field the decision to leave home at 14 years old and go to boarding school would be even if I weren't Native American. Um, I really only up until this point had thought that boarding schools existed in the realm of Harry Potter, um, but I'm sure that it had some impact on my decision to go. <laughs> Um, but also how ironic it was to be a young Native person choosing to leave home to attending boarding school and how different my choice looked uh, compared to other Native people throughout history. 
My grandfather went to an Indian boarding school in Toma, Wisconsin when he was just eight years old. To me, I was always affected both by how recent the trauma of boarding schools are in our history, just two generations ago, but also that in just two generations, we were already reclaiming these institutions as our own. And if going to boarding school wasn't ironic enough, I decided a year later it would be an amazing experience to attend an abroad program at 16 when I was a junior in high school, where 517 years after Columbus first left Spain to visit the New World, I returned the visit. <laughs> Again, I was afraid to go so far from home, but again, my mother told me, just go, just try it. Uh, we'll keep the fires burning for you in Oneida until you come home. I went on to attend Stanford University, and I've stayed in California ever since. I now work at Google, and I'm a lead of our Google American Indian Network there, which is an internal resource group that aims to make an impact in both the native community at and outside of Google. Looking back on my life and the radical decision to go to boarding school that changed the course of it, I know that leaving home was not possible for me in spite of my connection to place, uh, but because of it. For future Native youth, I hope we are able to tell them the same, to go out, to just try, and that we'll keep the fires burning until they return home. As I look ahead to my future, I'm aware that my life looks like a blood quantum case study. My mother is just shy of being, and I hate the term, full-blooded, but a full-blooded Oneida. So I am 7 16th Oneida, 1 16th shy of being truly half-blooded, which means that my children, if they don't have an Oneida father, will be 1 32nd short of a quarter of having enough blood quantum to be enrolled. For people with blood quantum like mine, this missing 1 32nd drop of blood brings the question, how is it possible if I am Oneida and that if being Oneida has defined my life so much, how can my children not be? I am dismayed at how it only takes marrying outside of Oneida essentially twice to bring down the legacy of the generations of Oneidas before me, seven and 10 on each side, and how easily blood quantum undermines their choices and sacrifices. It pains me in this view that my father has somehow weakened my identity through blood, when in truth he has only strengthened my identity, Oneida identity in practice. Growing up, he took me to Oneida language classes, accompanied me to events in the community, mapped our family tree, and always reminded me of our history, making it a relevant part of our family discussions growing up. He also helped other Oneidas tell their stories and document Oneida's history for the future. A few years ago, he wrote a book about the origin of our tribe's casino and my grandmo grandmother's part in it, conducting countless interviews with Oneidas in the community. It is called The Bingo Queens of Oneida, How Two Moms Started Tribal Gaming in Wisconsin. Oneidas, by tradition, have always had a pro-adoption policy and really no concept of blood or DNA as factors to membership of the tribe. As Haudenosaunee people, people of the Longhouse, we had a value of continually extending the rafters of the longhouse to make room for newcomers or those that had married into or been adopted into the tribe. Everywhere I've been in life, allies have been integral to flourishing communities that have withstood historical trauma. I believe it is vital that there are support systems and fresh points of view to move communities forward. And most importantly, there is always more work to be done for those that are willing to do it. I think that blood quantum or lineal descent has a role, but it's not the only factor in defining tribal identity and citizenship for the future. I don't think the same answer will be used for every tribe, as every tribe needs to decide ultimately what its goals are and its membership qualification should reflect that. The original goal of Native blood quantum was explicitly to see the disenrollment and demise of the legal status of Native Americans, which has likely already succeeded for my personal bloodline, which will end with me by the quarter blood quantum standards we have in place now. I would like to see my tribe's qualification methods change in my lifetime, and I believe we need to create a process that can grow and change for different generations as the needs of our communities change over time. However, as of now, I only have more questions than answers, unfortunately. As tribes themselves have their own identity issues, are we a race, are we a culture, a religion, a community, a business, a nation, a family, or are we all at once? I would like to see membership exist in different ways for tribes based on their different functions in these areas, so there would be a spectrum of citizenships. Could we have at least two different types of membership statuses, one that is cultural and another that is legal in nature? What would it take to have both an inclusion of required cultural knowledge, similar to a citizenship test, as well as other native blood included in tribal qualifications? As for some natives, they may, have, they may come from eight or six different tribes, be full-blooded Indians, but not have enough for any particular tribe to be enrolled. However, for pan-Indian blood quantum, tribes would need to be careful that tribal specificity was not eroded by a pan-Indian identity, so we could create a system that both unites us, but also preserves our unique tribal differences. Even if membership policies aren't changed in Oneida, I will raise my future children as Oneidas, regardless of their blood quantum. 
I believe that being Native American and being Oneida is less about what we are and more about what we do. Haudenosaunee teachings value decision-making processes that consider the impact to the next seven generations and is something we discuss often in Oneida. I am here today, speaking at Harvard, because of the decisions that my ancestors seven generations ago made to ensure our survival. It makes sense that my children actually won't be enrolled members, as I truly am the end of the seventh generation by the definitions that we have been imposed on, uh, that have been imposed on us. I am the end of blood quantum from my bloodline. But in looking ahead, I believe my future children will be the beginning of the next seven generations, which may not have blood quantum, but hopefully they'll have something much better. The ability to define, decide, and grow Oneida into the future based on our own ideas of identity for the survival of the next seven generations. And I believe that is something very much worth looking forward to. Thank you. You won't go. Pojo, Jijak, we in Dejanikas, Shawnee, Oklahoma, and Dojbia, Shishibani, Bodewadmi, and Dao. My name is, my English name is Taisha Zentek. Um, my Padawadmi name given to, me by my, given to me by my mother is Jijakwi, which means like a crane, um, originally from Shawnee, Oklahoma, and I'm a proud citizen of the citizen Potawatomi Nation. Um, as others have said before me, I'm grateful to, uh, today to be standing before you um, on Pawtucket, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag land for the first time in my life, and I also am um, grateful for the elders in the room who are allowing me to speak on this topic. Um, so before I share my thoughts on tribal citizenship, I wanted to give you a little bit of context of where I come from, both historically and geographically. Um, the Potawatomi uh, tribe as a whole originated in the Great Lakes area of Canada and northern United States, but we were forcibly relocated by several federal-backed removals. So you can see here um, the arrows in red are migrations that we did um, of our own accord, and then um, the green are were forcibly removal, forcible removals. <clears throat> um, during the most devastating of these removals, which we call the Trail of Death, um, 41 uh, mostly women and children died along the way from our woodland homelands in Indiana to northeast Kansas. Um, oops. After several broken uh, treaties and promises, uh, the federal government approached the Potawatomi in 1861 with, with a proposed treaty. The essence of that document stated that instead of living communally in Kansas, they would be private landowners and United States citizens. My ancestors weren't forced into signing the treaty or leaving the reservation, but a difficult decision faced them at that time and under those conditions. Having already tried to resist removal and live through the aftermath of the failed attempt and watch their children and mothers and relatives pass away, they opted to try a new legal and political strategy in hopes of gaining security for themselves and their families. Two thirds of those on the reservation opted to sign the treaty um, and they became ultimately known as the citizen Potawatomi. Um, and the rest um, who stayed on the communal lands are now known as the Prairie Band Potawatomi. Many promises again were made about what it meant to be a citizen and a landowner. They were told that they would, the, the citizen Potawatomi would have a census, that they would be able to survey the lands and then the tribal members would be able to choose which plot of land they wanted. Um, tribal members were supposed to receive money to buy seed and farming equipment to have two full seasons of crop production as a means of income. And then after those two years, the government would determine who was worthy and eligible to be US citizens, and those ready for citizenship would be taxed. Spoiler alert, that is not how it played out at all. My ancestors were taxed almost immediately, but had no source of income and therefore couldn't pay. So they were citizens in name, but not in practice. The federal government took the land of those people who failed to pay their taxes. So, and then six years later, the citizen Potawatomi Nation negotiated another treaty, the Treaty of 1867, which allowed tribal members to return their allotments back to the federal government, which were then sold to the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad Company. And those proceeds were used to purchase the citizen Potawatomi Nation's land in Indian Territory, which is now known as Oklahoma. So that migration from Kansas to uh, present-day Oklahoma began in the 1870s. 
But of course, the <laughs> promises were yet again broken, and just two decades later, in 1890, the federal government derailed those efforts um, to relocate through the Dawes Act of 1887, which that act dictated that the citizen Potawatomi accept individual allotments of land. And the lands that, were, that remain unallotted were classified as surplus. This is land, as you remember, that, these, uh, that my ancestors purchased. <laughs> um, so the unallotted land, that surplus, was opened up for non-Indian settlement. Um, and more than half of the original 900 square mile citizen Potawatomi reservation, approximately 300,000 acres, essentially disappeared overnight. Today, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation is one of nine bands of Potawatomi, with two First Nations in Canada and uh, seven uh, throughout the United States. Uh, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation is still headquartered in Shawnee, Oklahoma, in central Oklahoma, but our over 33,000 tribal citizens live in each of the 50 states, as well as internationally. As a result of commitment to self-governance, stable leadership, and an innovative constitutional reform, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation has not only survived but thrived. So now that you have some context, I want to jump to a two-decade period from the last century that had a huge impact on the tribe we are today. Let me pause here for a moment and acknowledge, as Olivia did, that every tribe is a sovereign nation, so with the ability to determine how their membership laws are, um, are set up. So the citizenship story I'm telling today is how the citizen Potawatomi nation decided what worked best for them and cannot simply be transferred to the unique needs of another tribal nation because context does matter. On the screen, you're seeing Article 2 from a 1961 amendment to our tribal constitution. In particular, I want to draw your attention to the portion circled in red, which is Section 1, Letter D of this article, in which our tribal council proposed that we move our tribal enrollment criteria to limit membership to anyone with a minimum blood degree of 1 8th. Exactly 100 years after our ancestors opted for a drastic citizenship change, the tribe voted 101 for and eight against this amendment, and it was approved by the U.S. Secretary of the Interior on April 24, 1961. I think it bears repeating. 109 people and a non-Potawatomi bureaucrat decided the fate of our tribal nation. So in case you're wondering what an eighth looks like, it's the small yellow wedge here. Much like thoroughbred horses, tribal citizens had to prove their pedigree in a way that they had never had to do before. This wasn't part of our traditional history. The decision at that time was due to a desire to limit the number of recipients of tribal per capita payments. Fewer citizen Potawatomi tribal members meant more money per person. Unfortunately, the science of blood quantum can be inexact at best and problematic at worst. I've heard stories of Indian agents recording different blood quantum amounts for siblings simply due to their appearance. When one sibling spent more time outside that summer, he or she would be noted as more Potawatomi than their brother or sister. <laughs> When I think about how much my makeup foundation color changes between summer and winter, <laughs> this makes me cringe at how in inaccurate the starting data could be. And if a citizen believed that this record was wrong, the burden of proof was on them, which could be an impossible task, especially if several years or even decades had passed since the original error was made. But the amendment passed, and it stood for the next two decades. In the late 1980s, our current tribal chairman, John Rocky Barrett, and other tribal leaders began to challenge this way of thinking. They argued that it was inauthentic to our traditional values to reduce our tribal citizenship connection to faulty records. Moreover, since blood quantum wasn't a traditionally Potawatomi policy, then where did it come from? It began in practice following the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, which aimed to curb the destructive allotment process. One of the byproducts of that law was establishing citizenship standards. I, along with many others, would argue that this was another tool of assimilation. As fewer people could lay claim to being Potawatomi, it wouldn't be too long until the citizen Potawatomi nation ceased to exist at all, which aligned quite neatly with the termination policies of that era. If that was the goal, it was certainly working. By 1988, the citizen Potawatomi nation had diminished to around 5,000 tribal members. Due to blood quantum restrictions, the tribe was also growing steadily older. The average age of the tribal members at that time was 45 or 45 years old, 
44 or 45 years old, and very few members' descendants met the blood degree requirements to enroll. The, the rule was literally disrupting family dynamics. As you'll see in the letter in the slide, a tribal member writes that due to the year of her birth, she was the only person in her family not to be considered Potawatomi according to the rules. She pleaded with the Bureau of Indian Affairs officer to reconsider, but her request, like that of so many others, was denied. However, there was still hope, as Chairman Barrett preaches to this day, if you're not in the business of constitutional reform, you're not in the business of tribal sovereignty. So he and others proposed another constitutional amendment to change the enrollment criteria yet again, and it passed. In 1989, the tribe vote, voted 1,919 to 343 to open the rolls. You might notice that there was a much larger turnout for this election than the one in 1961. <laughs> Families had quite literally been ripped apart as a result of the 1961 decision, and people were eager to reverse it. Under the new amendment, anyone, with, anyone who was descended from someone on the January 1937 tribal rolls could submit an enrollment application. And this is the same system that we have in place today, and our membership continues to grow. Now, instead of small per capita payments given to each tribal member, we invest tribal revenue back into services so that each tribal member can receive scholarships, health care, and hardship assistance, among countless other services. But history is made up of living people, and in my opinion, none of this means anything unless you can truly understand the impact of these citizenship policies on a family and personal level. So I'd like to share my own story with you. I have to confess, because blood quantum is a policy I vehemently oppose myself, it is something that I rarely discuss. When people find out that I'm Native American, the first question that they typically ask is, how much are you? As a side note, this is not a question that I hear asked toward other heritages or nationalities. On St. Patrick's Day on Saturday, for example, <laughs> thousands of people throughout the U.S. celebrated their heritage wearing, among other things, shirts that read, Kiss Me, I'm Irish, and I didn't, ask, I didn't hear anyone asking them how much they were. No, when people ask me, how much are you, I just don't answer the question. This is partially because I view it as a learning opportunity for the person asking, but also because I do not have my blood quantum memorized. It is simply not important to me to validate my tribal identity in this way. However, while pre preparing for this presentation, I pulled out my Certificate of Indian Blood CDIB card, those issued by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It's again a unique aspect of Native American identity. I didn't meet any card-carrying Irish people this weekend. <laughs> I checked the number on the card and I did some family research. I called our tribal roles department, I pulled up some old family tree records and I spoke to my grandma. And the story I learned blew my mind. So I invite you to join me down the rabbit hole that I discovered this past few weeks. So up here on the screen is my recorded blood quantum. For context, that's what that equates to. <laughs> Nine over 512 does not roll off the tongue. And I guarantee if I told anyone asking me how much I was, I would be laughed out of town or immediately dismissed. But that's where the story gets interesting. I called our tribal roles department with the intent of finding out at what point my family would have been ineligible to enroll based on the 1 8 rule of 1961. I learned that according to our tribal records, I would need to go back six generations to Josephine Weld to find anyone in our family who was at least an eighth. And this puzzled me a little bit because my great grandfather, Otman Blaze Picor, served as tribal chairman for several years, and my mother had been eligible to receive per capita payments before I was born during the period in which the 1 8 rule was in place. So how could the tribe's own chairman not meet the requirements, and how could my mother receive those benefits if she didn't meet that criteria? So after some digging, I found a history of our constitutional amendments, and I learned that the 1-8th rule of 1961 allowed anybody enrolled before the amendment passed to be grandfathered in, and that's how my family stayed on the rolls for several generations. My mother, born in 1959, was enrolled by her parents in 1960, just in time to miss the 1961 edition of the blood quantum criterion. And then I called my mother last week to tell her how lucky her timing had been. <laughs> she suggested that I call my grandmother to hear her side of the story. So I did, and here's what she told me. So even before 1961, our tribe had a semblance of blood quantum requirements in place. When descendants could, while descendants could enroll, certain services, including scholarships, were reserved to those with a higher blood quantum. As tribal chairman, my great-grandfather made an enemy of the person who oversaw tribal records. We don't know why, but it happens. <laughs> 
In addition, according to the kind of juicy gossip that I'm sure every family holds, my grandma beat the tribal enrollment officer's daughter to be elected president of the Catholic Women's Club, and she won the heart of my grandpa. And in revenge, and to prevent my great-grandfather's children, my grandparents, from receiving those services, the tribal enrollment officer modified the records. She decreased Otlin Blaze's PCORs Atlan Blaze PCOR's blood quantum to 164th. And in case you're wondering, I did, fact, I did fact check the story and the records bear it out. This is not a family myth. You can see the erasure marks on some of the records. <clears throat> Currently on the CPN tribal rolls, my great grandfather's blood quantum is listed as 164th because of that change. Now bonus points if you're paying attention and notice that this official tribal record from 1967, even with its handwritten modifications, has a different number for Otwin Blaze Pico or AB Pico or my great-grandpa. You'll also see that names of Josephine Wells and Margaret OG, all circled in red, that there are handwritten changes. And there's an asterisk that notes that there's some questions of the accuracy of the blood degree and that it could change if the Logan records are found. And if that confuses you, and it confused me, take a look at this alternate record, <laughs> which lists my grandfather's blood degree as 964th. Both of these came from our tribal roles department this past week, our official records. These are the type of imperfect records that so many tribes rely on today for citizenship. Thoroughly confused at this point, I asked my grandmother if she knows, based on our family history, what our blood quantum was before the vengeful eraser of the tribal enrollment officer struck. She shared that there was certainty within the family that my great-great-great-grandparents had each been half Potawatomi, which would have made each of them, each of their children half and my grandfather quarter. With a strike of a pencil, he went from a quarter to 164th. And my great-grandfather didn't take this development lying down, by the way. A family far ha farmhand who had been present at my great-great-grandmother's birth testified of her blood degree and in his 90s mailed a notarized letter to this effect to the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., I'm not sure how many cynics of bureaucracy are in the room today, but surely at least a few, of, a few of you aren't surprised what happened next. This notarized letter, the only copy, got lost. <laughs> so after Mr. Bertrand, the farmhands passed away, there was no recourse to pursue changing the record. And to further complicate the story, I'd always been told that my great-grandmother was also Potawatomi, and when I asked the tribal rules, um, specialist on the phone, what her blood quantum was. She replied with some confusion that there was a question mark next to her name in the official records. <laughs> According to my grandma, this was because she knew she was Potawatomi, but was unable to prove it because her mother had been disowned by her parents. So why am I telling you all of this family drama? <laughs> what does any of it have to do with today's topic of tribal citizenship? You see, had our tribe maintained the 1 8th blood degree minimum requirement enacted in 1961, even despite all the inaccurate records our blood degree is based off of, my mother would have slipped by just in time to enroll. But I wouldn't have. Although I was born in 1986, I couldn't enroll until after 1989 when the rolls opened up. My mother enrolled me in 1995. Despite knowing since I could talk that I was Potawatomi, I was this close to losing that piece of identity in a legal sense. Our legacy as a Potawatomi family would have ended with me. I wanted to include this side-by-side -side photo of what is now my grandma's house. This house sits on my, tribal, my family's tribal allotment land, which we still own the majority of and live on. The house was built before Oklahoma became a state, and as you can see, the house looks almost identical. Last year, we gathered my grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins for a photo shoot. It's hard to see, even the, but even my great-grandparents made an appearance in some portraits. Um, in this photo, nine of my family members either work for the tribe currently or retired from it. Three of us, myself included, currently hold leadership positions as department directors. We attend cultural events regularly. Um, in short, we take our identities very seriously and have dedicated our lives to maintaining the strength of our tribal nation. And what I'm trying to say is this. The crazy, messed up records don't change any of that. Even if they were correct, none of that would change. We are Potawatomi because our ancestors survived the trail of death and are resilient despite many efforts to wipe them out. We are Potawatomi because stories, traditions, houses, and even lands have been passed through the generations. We are Potawatomi because of who we are as a family and how each of us were raised. No yellow sliver will ever change that. When I say about Bodewatomi in Dao, or I am Potawatomi, like I did at the start of this presentation, there is no qualifier. I do not say I'm part Potawatomi, because I'm not. 
My tribe, as a sovereign nation, has enrolled me as a citizen based on a constitutional decision. My family has accepted me as Potawatomi citizen based on our heritage and history. And it's as simple as that. Bodewadmi and Dao. Miigwech. I, w I was enrolled uh, last week as a full-blood pirate. Uh, <laughs> so I have my card, and so if anybody wants to check my lineage, you can. Um, it's not Halloween, and I'm trying to figure all this out. Um, so in terms of we talk about blood quantum, as you look at the picture, um, you don't need to be a math major to figure out um, um, where this goes. And um, just a little bit about the book is that when I saw the cartoon by Marty Tubles, who is a cartoonist, I said, there's a book behind that cartoon. And then, um, then I went and found a publisher who said they would publish the book if we wrote it. And so before one word was written, we had a book. And, um, and we did it in, in an anthology. We had 24 writers from across the world. Um, if you think about doing an anthology, don't. Uh, nobody ever meets a deadline, <laughs> and so, uh, but nonetheless, we have, we have a book, and this is uh, called The Great Vanishing Act, uh, Blood Quantum and the Future of Native Nations. So this affects really hundreds of tribes, and, and it's important for tribes to have a conversation about who they are, who decides, how do we do this, and the Potawatomi we certainly have done that, and our tribe is... Uh, sort of engaged at this point. They're avoiding the topic. So, um, you know, I knew Olivia's family for four generations, you know, and, and uh, she's got the longevity genes in her family, so I expect she'll be around for a while. And, um, but she kind of knew where she was going when she was small, that, you know, she ended to leave and then she would come back. So I expect that you'd be tribal chair one of these days and make all your mistakes at Google and then come back home, you know. <laughs> Um, but she was all, also Miss Oneida. I still think she's Miss Oneida. It was 2015, huh? 14. 14. Well, see, time flies, yeah. yeah. Well, I want to say, Megan was Miss Baby Oneida when she was three, you know, so some of you know her, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, she reminded me of a Van Morrison song, uh, Brown Sugar, so we used to call her that. She was walking around. But when she's about nine years old, I, I, I worked at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I would drag her along to meetings, and so we'd be some remote, remote place on campus. And then I'd say, I'll race you back to the office, you know, but I took a different path than she did. And she would always beat me back to the office. And uh, I tried to lose her several times, and I couldn't do it. And she says, you know, when I come to school here, well, I have to go on the tour. And I says, you'll probably give the tour when you're, when you're, uh, before you're enrolled. So she knew a lot about that campus. Um, so I'm really proud of her work. She, um, she has a better Rolodex than I have at this point, which is wonderful. Um, when I uh, first got into higher education, um, uh, I had a group interview with a number of uh, white faculty members, and, and the first question, one of the first questions they asked me is saying, why are you an Indian? You know, and I sort of was shocked because nobody's ever asked me that question. And I quickly responded and said, well, it came with the body, why, you know? <laughs> and I was gonna say, why are you white? You know, and, but nobody ever asked anybody that question or, 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 or about that. But you know, on reflection, it's really a great question. But it's not an interview question. It's one, one that you should ask yourself internally. Who am I? And, and your identity is a lifelong process. It's a, it's a process, not an event, of who you, be, who you are. But um, one that you share with your family and your close friends and your relatives, and, you know, and talking about identity and who belongs and why. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you, you can't run from who you are or where you came from, no matter what you do or how far you go. And so, Olivia, you know you always have a home. You may have a house in California, but you have a home in Wisconsin, and that you know where that is, you know? And some of our people don't know that. Um, um, 
My grandmother was um, born in 1876, the year of when uh, the Sioux and the Cheyenne defeated Custer. And uh, she's a Mohawk, but she was an orphan. And um, uh, she was adopted by a doctor in Philadelphia. And so she graduated from medical school in 1899. And she said, uh, and that's another story, but she said, uh, going to school and getting an education are two different things. And they don't always happen at the same time. So, um, you know, if you're an Indian student here at Harvard, you know, you've got two majors, whether it's history or policy or law. But the other major you have is being a native and that you have to work on that, whatever that means. It means you need to go home, you have to engage in the community. You just can't, uh, one of the poorest markers for any identity marker, of course, is blood quantum. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. And, it, and um, so uh, my grandmother worked, uh, uh, well, she was doing volunteer work. I'll just do a quick family history. She, she was doing volunteer work at Carlisle, met my grandfather. They, fell in love and they, and they did something stupid like get married, but they did. And, and so in 1906, she moved to the, to the Oneida Reservation. So she had, her, she had six kids in eight years, the youngest one with five-month-old twins, and my grandfather dies of appendicitis before she could get him to surgery. So she raised um, six children with, um, in World War I, the Depression, the Korean War, and World War II as a single-family country and one doctor. And uh, so I grew up thinking everybody had a grandmother that was a doctor. It's not true. It's not true. But anyway, I've, you, know, you, you know, you come into this world, you can't pick your relatives. Some, some of them you'd like to get rid of maybe, but you always can't pick your relatives. But she had her kitchen clinic open 24-7 for nearly 50 years. And she gave, um, uh, I used to work at the college, Menominee in, in uh, uh, some girls were they're about ready to have a baby. I says, I got forceps and I'm not afraid to use them. And you would never not have that baby here in college because I wouldn't know what to do with them. But nonetheless, um, uh, she gave birth to hundreds of uh, Oneidas and maybe some of your relatives. I don't, I don't know. They, you know. They were a lot of home births and she did a lot of home visits when, when people did that in 20s and 30s and 40s. And... Um, so in 1947, on Thanksgiving Day, the tribe had a, a ceremony, and they adopted her. And they adopted her into the United Tribe. But they never uh, enrolled her. But she was part of the community, you know, and she was grateful that, they were, that she was included, but never included legally, but, um, or politically, or any other way that you measure. And, and, and so... Uh, I ended up being Mohawk Oneida, and my mother was, was, uh, was Cree. But again, measuring in that way is just doesn't make any sense. The Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederacy, had a tradition of adoption. To keep our, our populations up and our, and our people up, we adopted people from other tribes, Hurons or, you know, Matinicox or any, anybody, and they became part of our, our nation. So, uh, well, and it, you know, if we captured somebody like a Huron, uh, we'd bring him in, and um, they could take my, if I, was, if I was killed in battle, they would take my place. So I became a father and uncle in, in that role in the community. So you, you're on one year probation. And, um, and if you didn't pass probation, uh, the women got to torture you, and if they did within, if you died within 24 hours, it's a bad job. So it was some, uh, quite an incentive to get with the program, you know. And so we, we kept our people together. Um, so, you know, there's adoptions into tribes, legally, ceremonially, uh, you know, and some of the adoption papers were buried and people can't figure out uh, where they belong or who they belong to. So um, it's, it's problematic. Um, so saying you're an Indian and being an Indian are two different things. You know, and, um, you know, we got so many pr uh, Cherokee princesses running around here, we don't know how to count them. Um, so the book was, um, was, um, was intended to educate and engage people because there was nothing out there in terms of writing. And so we had, I mean, we got uh, uh, authors from around the world in, in Japan and in Maori, 
in, um, let me see if I can find my glasses here. There is, um, people said that they, uh, either the government was awfully lucky or, or they intended to, um, to do away with us. And I think this is uh, Senator Higgins from Delaware in 1895 said this. It seems to me one of the ways of getting rid of Indian, the Indian question is intermarriage and the gradual fading out of Indian blood. The whole quality and character of the Aborigine disappears. They lose all of the traditions of the race. There's no longer any occasion to maintain any tribal relations. And there is then every reason why they shall go out and take their place as white people do everywhere. So that's 1895. You know, when, uh, well, in 1924, um, my father was 12 years old and he became a citizen. Now, we were here 10,000 years before that, so I guess they figured we were going to stay, you know. And, and uh, so um, in 1934, 10 years later, the uh, Indian Reorganization Act was, was, uh, was passed. And uh, some Indians call it as the Indian New Deal, and some other Indians call it the Indian Raw Deal. And it was both, you know. But we got a chance to um, restore tribal governments but government lawyers wrote the constitutions in which they introduced the, uh, the issue of, of blood quantum. We were able to buy some land back. You saw, you gotta remember, 1934, we're in the middle of the depression, so we didn't have much. And so they were offering goodies. And they said, oh, by the way, we gotta have rolls and you gotta, you gotta do measure by blood quantum. And also, one of the other things, the footprints was, uh, uh, the footnotes was saying, Robert's Rules of Order, you know, and sometimes it just turns to Robert's Rules of Disorder um, because our traditional way of, of making decisions was consensus. It wasn't majority. You know, you don't need 50% plus one because the other 49% tries to undermine that whole operation. And so consensus does take a, takes longer, but I think we need to find a traditional way that we can get closer to consensus, and that way, uh, decision will stick. Um, now, where was I with that? Where was I going with that? Um, so the tribal leaders agreed to it, like in many places, our guys did. But you know, they they married the the girl next door, and say so they were full bloods, and so they would have said maybe, this is going to be a problem, but it's not going to be our problem. And here we are, two and a half generations later, that we've got, uh, we're talking about, you know, you know, we know right now that in Oneida, 46% of our people are quarter bloods. Another 14% are less than half. Indians marry out, including Oneidas, more than any other ethnic group. And it's not hard to see, if you look at demographics, that we don't come from families of 10 and 12 anymore. We have families of one and two. So our, our uh, uh, mortality rate is higher, is going to be higher. So our, our population is going to curve like this. And, and the birth rates are going to be lower. And so we're going to come theoretically to a point where we're going to have zero. So we're all, I don't know if you guys know, issue in two worlds. It's the last Indian they found in some California tribe. And he lived in the basement of a museum. You know, it was just a horrible story. But you know, I, I would hate to think that we are all going to become issues at some point in time. So we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to reinvent ourselves. One of the things that is happening in Oneida at this point, we've done, we, we, we thought, well, God, we, we see the trend. And we're, we're in a box we can't get out of. Because anytime you ask anybody who they are, you know, I'm glad you don't tell them. I'm, half this or a quarter of that or an eighth or whatever, is that uh, we identify ourselves by our own blood quantum. So it's, we've been institutionalized to think of ourselves in fractions. You know, and, um, and so it's, it's a difficult box to get out of, and, and, and we, do, we can't afford not to have the conversation. No tribe can afford not to have, you know, or, you know, and the enemy, the biggest enemy we have right now is not the government, it's time. Time is our biggest enemy. And so, um, so we've got big decisions to make, and we'd like to get to consensus. So it's happening at this point for our folks. We, we did a lot of 
articles in the newspaper, and we had brown bags, and we had summits, and we've been doing a lot to, you know, to uh, educate people with the thing is, and, and then I like came out of this is the, is the book. Uh, but it's really a complicated issue. So if we were, we got 17,000 members right now, so if we went to one eighth, uh, we'd have over 25,000. And then 20 years later, we have the same conversation because we're going to go to the 16th. So it doesn't work. And so every time, exponentially, our population increases, but we can't afford the benefits. So we have three elephants in the room. One is uh, benefits. The other ones are descendants. Usually you only get one elephant in the room, but you get, we got three. Uh, and the other ones are ancestors. And somebody else, uh, Chaz Wheelock, like, suggested to me that we have a whole herd of elephants, you know. And so, um, so we have it. It's, it's really kind of a Rubik's Cube, you know. And if you take it and twist it, and, and you know the configurations you can get into, well, you know, but every one of these squares has an issue. And once you solve one issue, you create another one. You know, and so uh, it, it's not a simple answer. So people get the book and they say, well, we'll re just read the last chapter. There's a silver bullet there. We're going to ride into the sunset with a, <laughs> with a solution. I said, not so, not so. So it comes to be, are we members of a club that provides benefits to its members? Or are we citizens of a nation? And if we're citizens of a nation, we have responsibility. You know, and what is that responsibility to ourselves and to each other? And so we got to talk about responsibility. And we got to talk about, does it mean, well, if I know, if I can count to 10 in my language, or, or do I have to know the history? Um, do, am I connected to the community? Uh, there's kinships, you know? Um, yeah, I'm sure in your family reunion, you can find 300 members, you know? Yeah, uh, but I mean, the, we're all interconnected in some way. So we have to figure out how to, so our, our grandmothers, in a sense, are saying, you know, and of course, you know, grandmothers, you know, they love their children, they love their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, you know, so they want them to be part of the nation because they've uh, had the fruits of, of being a member and they have get per capita and they get health and they get uh, other kind of goodies, I guess you would call them, you know, that are benefits of the nation and they want them enrolled. And, but they, that's in their heart. In their head, they know blood content doesn't work over time. And so we're sort of stuck in a paralysis right now uh, of, of trying to make a decision. And uh, I, I'm trying to figure out how do you put those two folks together next to each other, not opposing each other, but to have a conversation saying, how can we have it? Can we have it both ways? Um, and maybe, maybe not, you know? If you talk to Orrin Lyons, he'd go right straight back to the traditional way. Matrilineal, and if you're not born here, and you're not part of your mother's line, you're, you're not a member. Um, the Potawatomis really came up with a unique kind of solution for them. And, and as a sovereign nation, they have every right to do that. So they get to decide. And so every tribe gets to decide. And so that's really going to be the act of self-government, of who we are and where we come from. So, we have to live in the past, the present, and the future at the same time. We need to look forward and look back at the same time. Move forward, look back, and that's why we get a perspective. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So not doing anything is going to be a problem. Faulkner said, uh, the past is never dead, it's not even past. You know, so I think we need to think about um, uh, about these about these issues. Now, I wrote a speech before I came. <laughs> I made all kinds of notes, and I have three speeches, and I've I haven't done any of them. So let me let me see if I can catch up and see if there's anything else I need to. Am I 15 minutes up? Yes, uh, sir. It is, huh? <laughs> about three minutes ago. About three minutes. Oh, good. I was afraid I didn't have enough material. Yeah. <laughs> um, Probably catch it in the Q and A. Yeah. Well, we have to find our is finding our collective better self, um, and Indian, indigenous people around the world are at risk. I mean, it's just not us. There's 52 tribes, I think, in Peru, and they're you know you, you can go back 200 years. What happened here is happening to them for resources, 
there, this genocide. And so, um, you know, so the, the problem is what matters here? Um, and sovereignty matters. If we're tribal nations, sovereignty matters. Institutions matter. You know, we have elected leaders. We have tribal councils. We have schools. We have health centers. We have rec centers. We have our institutions, and they matter. They matter a lot. Culture matters. So our, our language, our creation stories, our, our language, our, all the things that entail of who we are as a cultural people count, and they matter. And leadership matters. And so, um, so everyone counts. And everybody is a leader. It's just not, you know, some, some people back home say, well, Hill's got a, a solution up his sleeve. He just he, he told us yet, you know. Well, you know, I wish I did. And so um, I think I'm just going to stop here and collect my stuff and sit down. But I appreciate um, your attention. And thank you for showing up. I, I really... Yeah, there is a buzz in Indian country about blood quantum, you know, and um, um, and so it may be the best, the the, the most important decisions um, that Indians will make this century, you know, because really our survival depends on it. So thank you. Thank you to all three of our panelists. And, and I think, Norbert, you're, that question, I think you're absolutely right. I think that is a tremendously important question for our time. Uh, I'm going to highlight just a few things and then ask one question of the 15 that I've ha I have here oh so we God. can maximize our time for you to ask questions. Um, but a couple of points that were made by the various presenters that I wanted to, to highlight. And, and others that were just sort of um, obliquely referred to that I want to actually hi highlight in particular. And that is the premium attached to um, belonging. Uh, I'm not going to use the loaded words, or is it a member or you're a citizen? But the, the concept of belonging, the, the, there is a premium attached to the answer to that question in the last several decades that that is that is bears on this conversation because it's not just native people that are interested in the answer to that question there's a whole lot of eyes uh, looking from the outside in the inside courts are looking politicians are looking your neighbors are looking everyone wants to see how does that question get answered because there's a lot writing on that question, whether or not a community gets to do certain things, whether or not a child gets covered by the Indian Child Welfare Act, whether benefits and other kinds of things are going to flow to certain members or to an entire community. Um, and then there's abstract concepts that are in play there. The uh, folks will talk about what are the systems, the processes happening within the communities um, that are evolving to help redress that question. And if things don't strike outsiders as fair, as if it's their business, but in a way it is their business because all of this is happening within the context, of course, of the nation state. And so this whole phenomena that all three of our panelists spoke about, the tribe's sovereignty operating within the larger matrix of a nation state, these questions are not being asked and answered in a vacuum. They're not being asked and answered uh, in the abstract. There are a lot of eyes that are paying attention. The courts are intensely interested in this because they regularly get appeals from folks who have been disenrolled, who have been declared not members or not citizens. And so they're looking anywhere they can for an audience to say whether it's Congress, like the freedmen of the Cherokee Nation found an audience with uh, Congress that, that held lots of appropriations over the heads of the Cherokee Nation until there was a change there. Uh, and the courts, if you haven't read their opinions, are very sympathetic. Not because I think they like Indians, because I think that they understand that there's a premium on the part of the nation to keep those numbers down. In other words, Everything that our panelists talked about here represents a trajectory about the inev inevitable decline and elimination of Native peoples. 
And sustaining sovereignty and sustaining membership, sustaining citizenship is sort of a reversal of that. It's a contestation uh, of, of that trajectory. And so there are, put, there are forces that push back on that. So I just wanted to make that uh, note in terms of the context in which these decisions, as difficult as they are, are even rendered more difficult because of the political and legal and even moral uh, context in which those questions are being asked. So a question, one question to each of you. Uh, we've used words, there, the vocabulary uh, that goes along with these very fraught issues uh, float uh, amongst a number of terms, citizens, members, even indigenous. What does that mean? Um, and it's very difficult to wrap your heads around that. As some of you may know, the, 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 folk, the folks who gave us the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples ultimately elected not to have a definition of indigenous in that formative document because of these uh, challenges that we face. So let me ask the panelists, what do those terms mean to you in the broader context and matrix of belonging, what do those terms mean to you, if anything? Well, you know, um, first of all, we're, we're governments, mm -hmm. we're nations. And so we get to decide, you mm -hmm. know, and, and one of the problems that uh, we just got the BIA off our backs, so we get to make decisions <laughs> and we don't have to wait for their approval any longer. Mm -hmm. But that took a long time to make our constitutional change because we became wards of the government, thanks to the IRA government. So, so but we're, if we're sovereign nations, we should be sovereign. You know, we should be able to have, uh, have our own self-government. You know, if we say we're a tribe, then we have members. But, uh, you know, the, the language I like to use is that I'm a, I am a citizen of the Oneida Nation. Mm -hmm. So instead of using the word nation, using, uh, using the word tribe, and we're just so used to it, we get really sloppy in our language, but we have to see ourselves as nation, national citizens of the particular group that we belong to, and we have to respect that. Mm -hmm. so, that Good, thank you. Um, I would agree. Uh, because we have so many tribal members and because descendancy is a sort of uh, loaded term amongst different Native American tribes, whether or not that that is something that they agree with. Um, you know, sometimes people view the decision of our of the, the citizen Pawnee Nation to um, adopt U.S. citizenship in 1861 as a um, act of an act of assimilation. Um, but I like the term citizen because in 1861, what um, what my nation did was decide how they wanted to be seen. They decided that they wanted to be citizens. That was their, they, they, it was an act of sovereignty. They had tried hiding. They had tried you know, resisting removal. They had tried being removed and you know, living on the new land. None of that worked. So they made the decision to become citizens of the United States. Um, and, um, at, but at the same time, they remain citizens of the Potawatomi Nation. So for me, that's, that's, uh, that, it, that it can perfectly encapsulates what um, a tribe is, the citizen of a nation. Um, yeah, I would say, I mean, looking at member versus citizen, like the active, um, kind of asking something of our members, of our mm -hmm. citizens that, one, we're running out of time. We don't have the resources. Our languages are dying. Uh, we have finite um, resources and efforts that we don't really have the luxury to not learn the language, to not carry on the culture. If we don't pass on the torch in our generation, there won't be a torch to have. Mm -hmm for the next generation. I think that comes across in, you know, I think everyone's embrace all of the word citizen. Um, but I think parts of that, there's, there's also a sacrifice to that. I think we use member almost because uh, tribes are like a family. So it's a family member. We don't necessarily require anything of your aunt or your uncle. We don't say you have to sign a contract and you know, learn the language and come to all my birthday recitals or you know, all of my different events. I would love it if you did and I kind of <laughs> expect you to, but we don't make that a, require, a hard requirement. Um, but I think that was a luxury of the past. I think we're moving into a place where we can't just hope that everyone will be you know, great upstanding members. We need to um, uh, institutionalize citizenship and ask for something as well um, if we are going to survive into the next uh, 
into the next generation and pass that torch on to the next seven generations of, of native youth. Um, and I think when it comes to indigenous, I, I didn't know that, that they um, didn't choose to make an official definition. I, I feel like indigenous is a word like love or something that's very abstract, that it shows more about what um, we have and what we think about that than the unique um, ramifications of what we try to define it. I think, you know, the, you can't define love, you can't define um, a word like that. And I think it's helpful in the indigenous community to have multiple different definitions so that we can talk about the different um, statuses of, of citizenship. So there's elements of citizenship that's very legal. There's elements that are very emotional and spiritual and personal of um, what it feels like to be native. And then um, I think this indigenous term is a really safe word and a safe place for indigenous people from all globally um, to, to live in and to use as a benchmark for us all to kind of grapple with our understandings of what it means to be indigenous to us. So, so uh, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, if we have some foreign nationals fit at us, we don't say we have some Russian members or Canadian members. We say we say they're citizens of their nation. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, it, you know, that's, that's what it is. So I, I like to use the word citizen both as a noun and a verb, you know, to, to be active. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, I think we have about 15 minutes um, for your questions, and the microphone is here. <laughs> so if you could please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit where, where you're from, and then direct, if you want to direct it to the whole panel or to one person in particular. Sure. Um, thank you for being here. This has been awesome. Um, my name is Merritt Bear, and my family is Ogallala Lakota from Pine Ridge. Um, I want to ask the elephant in the room question, which is playing Indian. Um, the Cherokee grandmothers, we can set aside Elizabeth Warren for the time being, but just the general kind of ancestry.com, my DNA results say that I am 4% Indian and the kind of desire to partake in the sexiness and, and wear Pocahontas costumes while not actually grappling with or not being claimed by any tribe. Thank you. Um, I recently went to the National Museum of American Indian in Washington, D.C. They have a new um, exhibit that's amazingly modern, um, and it's called Americans, I believe. Um, but one of the questions it asked was, why, is, why are Native Americans everywhere and yet nowhere? Why, you know, is there a Native American on the Land O'Lakes butter, you know? Why are these symbols everywhere? Why are these stories oh, yeah. everywhere? And yet, why are our issues not? Why are we as real people not in our discussions of our current um, current struggles, why are those not in the forefront? And I think um, whenever I ground myself in questions like this, I like to go more general, like why is this, what was the structure that was in place that made, you know, the instances that we see in our everyday lives, how did those happen? Um, so that's kind of where I ground myself when it comes to those like individual moments. You know, some people uh, come to us and say they want to take uh, DNA to figure out what tribe they belong to. Well, that, that's not possible, you know, you can, tell who your parents are and, and, and that sort of thing, but you can't tell what tribe. There's just no, no test, test to do that. I had a, uh, uh, we were doing scholarships and we had a Cherokee mother call me and she said, um, did, did I tell you about that? Did I say that? Oh, um, she, she was arguing, you know, mothers just maybe crazy because they get real, you really have the student talk to you, but the mom called. She says, I want you to know my son is 13th, 256 degree Cherokee. And she's just chewing me out, you know. And, and I said, ma'am, if, if he cuts himself shaving, how much blood is left? And I held a phone way out here. And she was still, you could hear her screaming at me in the next room. But yet, at the same time, uh, the young man was a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. So it wasn't my role to decide uh, whether he was eligible or not. But, you know, um, we have people in a variety of places. I think we have some Oneida someplace don't, can't find Wisconsin on the map, mm -hmm. you know, but they want to enjoy the benefits of it, you know. So we got to figure out how do we connect community as a verb mm -hmm. uh, to, to those folks, so. I think going back to citizenship too, like, you know, if you want to be Oneida and you want to come to Oneida, live in Oneida, learn the language, you know, take on the practices, do all of the work, yeah, call yourself Oneida if you're gonna do all of those things, you know? 
So this has been a challenge for us. When we opened up the roles, you have a lot of members who may or may not have a connection with the tribe in any way, or may not have a, a way to be connected. Um, I always try to kind of re remind myself that um, the reason that a lot of Potawatomi or other um, uh, tribal citizens are removed from their culture or their heritage um, is not the fault of the person living today. It's a, po it's a fault of policies, um, yeah. Of boarding schools, of, of removals, things like that. Um, adoption. adoption, absolutely. Um, now, today, they can do things to connect with their tribe, but it's, they weren't born um, you know, guilty of that sin. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we do have a lot of tribal members. And one thing that we've done in a 2007 constitutional reform, you might be sensing a pattern here, <laughs> our tribe likes to reform its constitution. <laughs> um, in 2007, we reformed our constitution um, to have tribal legislative districts. So each district has a uh, representative, a legislator, who represents the constituents of that area. So it doesn't matter if you live in California, you have a uh, representative from the Potawatomi Nation who represents you, um, who uh, speaks on behalf of their constitu constituents at the quarterly meetings and holds cultural um, events um, and educational events in that area. They get some money from our, tri from our tribal headquarters to do that. So that's one way we've tried to address that. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't Potawatomi who um, you know, are kind of in, in it for the benefits, um, but we've tried to put into place ways for them to become connected um, as tribal citizens. Thank you. Hi, Jay Gleason, I'm not Native American, mm -hmm. but uh, since the subject has come up, uh, Elizabeth Warren is up for re-election this year, so this question is gonna keep coming up. As you said, uh, saying you're an Indian is not the same thing as being an Indian, uh, so we know what's been said, but we're still not clear on how you can be that or how you feel about someone that says that, that can be that, because you've been struggling with this definition yourself and if you can't pin it down, then it's going to continue to entertain these doubts about people that say these things. And you haven't also said how, how you be, quote unquote, an Indian. Uh, that, that, that also seems to be a little bit amorphous. And finally, I would say that you're not only struggling with questions of citizenship, but the larger society is. We have a lot of what is called illegal aliens from one perspective or undocumented immigrants from another. And I don't know whether you're going to have these same problems or not, but citizenship nestled within citizenship is also uh, an open question for the, for the whole society. And maybe it is for your more narrow focus, too. I don't know. But I would be interested in both of those uh, kinds of subjects. Well, yeah. if uh, we, we, in 1492, if we had better immigration laws, we wouldn't have this problem. So <laughs> everybody, you know, they got here. They forget how they got here, you know. Um, you know, you know, working in college and universities, and I'm sure this happens to Shelley and others. That, well, how many how many natives are enrolled? And that in, in it's self identification. Uh, they say they're Indians, and they might have a wonderful Cherokee princess story in their family, or some other kind. Of, and maybe there is some heritage, but unless they can identify the specific tribe they belong to. Now, the, of course, the admissions form can't put down 500 different tribes. I don't. I, you know, I been doing this all my life and I don't know all the tribes but um, excuse me all the nations <laughs> and and uh, to determine but there's got to be a way to connect to the community how do you connect to the communities I mean we uh, some of you may remember Ward, Ward Churchill and if he, he can't name a relative dead or alive his citizenship is certainly suspect you know um, you know in, you know, so, you know, you got Heather Lockley running around out there. She's a, she's a lumby, you know, but she looks like Snow White, you know. And so we have every gradation. So you don't, we all don't look like we stepped off the nickel, you know. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, we've got to come to grips with what, what, is, what is really being part of our community. It's not passing the, what's the litmus test? I, you know, I don't think there is one because you can pass the test and, Put out your hand for the check, you know. So we've got to figure out how, how to um, engage our people in an authentic way. Yes. Hi there. Um, my name is Love Richardson, and I'm a tribal councilman for the Nipmuc Nation. And um, for our for our band, um, for our nation, we use descendancy. With that is community. 
So I was wondering if descendancy was an option for any of your nations, and um, how do you define community? How do you define what? Community. Uh, so that's one of the yeah. definitions for mm -hmm. membership. So yeah. I was wondering if that's the definition, how would you define that? Mm. So the Citizen Potawatomi Nation does use descendancy as its um, enrollment criterion. So as long as we, we our, our role of record is the 1937 role, and as long as you can prove an unbroken um, descendancy from that role, then you are considered a, a member of the citizen, or a, a citizen of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Um, the definition of community is a lot harder <laughs> um, because I do think, as, as uh, other panelists have said, um, that requires an action, that requires active participation. Um, and at least for the citizen Potawatomi Nation, that's something that um, people, people come to at different points in their lives. Um, there are people who are in their 50s who are now starting to connect to their community, and so we are trying, we try to have resources available for them and try to you know, ref, you know, uh, refrain from judging them that that's the point of their lives where they're wanting to connect to their community, whereas we have some who are born into it. Um, but I, I think community, for me, is defined by action. So I, I you know, for uh, college students, I look for return on investment. You know, uh, so if you accept the benefit, the check for financial aid or scholarship, you have a responsibility back to that party in some fashion. You know, so the community means engagement. I mean, we have people living in California and haven't been home in three generations, you know, and, and I don't see them part of the community. You know, um, they may be technically and legally enrolled, but at the same time, you know, I, my first job as a native is to protect the homeland. You know, how do I make the community better? Now, if there's um, benefits that accrue to that, that's fine. But it, the benefits don't come first. It's that how do, I, how do I make the nation better? And that's my responsibility as a citizen. And, um, you know, and, and I suppose identity is really on a continuum. You know, we got, you know, from, can I count to 10 or... One little, two little, three little Indians, or you got somebody, a, a Sundance chief, um, that practices who we are. I mean, so everybody's on the continuum someplace, but it's a lifelong process, the identity. And so you've got to, as a tribe, as a nation, you have to figure out how, how you get your citizens to engage. Um, so it's not about bingo. If I can. Um step out of my role of, of moderator just for a second to join that question, because it's a very good question. Um, Shelly mentioned when she in introduced me, I'm from the United Home Nation in Louisiana. We're not federally recognized, but there's a whole yeah. other layer of yeah. discussion there. There's uh, over 100 tribes that share that status, including many here in New England, um, who through luck of our accident of history uh, and so forth, but we still have those same challenges in terms of what is the community and how do we um, assess belonging. So here I am, a New Englander, having moved up back up here in uh, 86. But as Norbert said, my, my understanding of community, there's not a day that I don't wake up and I think, besides what I'm going to have for breakfast that morning, is um, how's my community doing? What is my community doing and what can I do to help my community? So I'm still, there is this sort of elastic understanding of what my community means. I think for those of us who, who practice our indigeneity in exile, in other words, we're not in our homelands, but the homelands are still here and that's very real for us. I guess that would be the conversation I would want to have with someone is, is that homeland residing within you in a very real way and is there a community um, that you can go back to and, and knows who you are and understands you. Um, and that sense of community, um, I think, is, is something around which we have to grasp with because of our mobile society. I think we have time for maybe one more question. I have probably too much to say, but um, I'm a non-native. I've been a native rights supporter for over 35 years, and I'm part of a no local Native community. Mm -hmm. Every couple of years, I have to remind everybody that I'm not Native. Um, 
and I've been accused of trying to pass for non-native. <laughs> I may be the only person that's ever happened to. But um, I think that there's um, a parallel, uh, well, what it is with natives, I think, is about self-determination, and that's why I call myself a supporter. That's my role. Uh, but um, I myself am um, a Jewish atheist, and 100%, so I know I'm not part Native. Uh, but I've had people look at me and say, you look Native. And finally it occurred to me a few years ago that um, I'm part Moorish and I'm part Kazakh, and you can see it looking at me. And uh, in fact, by the uh, conventional definitions, I'm not white. And I went through an identity crisis and realized that I had grown up being considered white. I consider myself white. I have white privilege. I'm white. Uh, seems pretty obvious when I think it through. Um, anyway, I, I am interested in the whole thing of dividing and conquering, starting with things like uh, assuming that tribes are, of course, um, uh, patrilineal and setting up tribal councils that are of men, and uh, so forth. I just, go on, go on. Um, I was just going to yeah. jump in really quickly. Um, so I uh, am in, work, in edu work, work in education within my tribe, and so do a lot of uh, sessions on identity with college students or high school and middle school students. And one exercise that we often do um, with Native American students, not just Potawatomi, but others in Oklahoma, we have a lot of different tribes, um, we ask students to describe what a Native American person looks like and what they wear and what they, how they wear their hair. Um, and mm. then inevitably, as they, des they describe that, when we go across, around the room and look at all the Natives in the room, nobody looks like that. <laughs> there isn't <laughs> one definition for how a Native American person looks. Um, and because, as we talked about today, it is a citizenship, um, there's no one way that an American citizen looks. There's no one way that a Potawatomi citizen looks. So there's a really wide variation there. Um, there's no one way of looking Native. Um, it's something that I think a lot of Natives even struggle with. I was just going to say, uh, thank you for being an ally. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes we don't do that. We expect a lot from our allies, but we never say thank you. But also, uh, I've talked to to several Indian students for years, and, and, and uh, if an ally hit them upside the head, they wouldn't recognize it. So we have to teach our people how to recognize allies. And they're not always from your same family, same clan, same tribe. And sometimes those guys are dream killers, you know, and sometimes mm -hmm. some people will help. And so we have to recognize it. So we got to figure out what the partnerships are. Um, but what I'm worried about is that we may terminate, terminate ourselves with our own hand. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's so we may conquer and divide ourselves. We don't oh. need any help from from Donald Trump or anybody yeah. else. Yeah. So, but also there's a question about giving back, and uh, Olivia lives in California, but I think she thinks of ways to figure out how to give back to the homeboys. I did that, you know. But you know, even if some, some people live in Denver, but they belong to Ogallala or Cherokee, they can tutor Indian kids in Denver. And that's giving back to the community, you know. But you, you just can't lose the thread that, that it gives you to belong. So you can belong to an urban committee or, or a group like yourselves. And uh, that's always appreciated. So there's a way to get your arms around it, but you have to be clever and you have to be willing to do it. Mm -hmm. so. And I think, Norm, you as, as a role model for Oneidas, you are the epitome of someone who you know, left, got amazing experience, got amazing skills, came back to the tribe. You've just retired and now are back in Oneida. And I think that's what we, that's the dream. That's what we hope of our Native youth, that they go off and they, you know, do great, amazing things, learn amazing things, and then take those learnings back to our tribes and our homelands. So I, I didn't know how much Indian I was until I moved off the reservation, because <laughs> I have to defend it. You know, at home, I just get to be one of the guys, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have to defend it when you're, when you're there and saying, you know. Yeah, kind of on uh, the point on um, it being Indian in exile. I think when you are in the place, the place kind of gives you the reason. Yeah. You 
are yeah. I'm when, I, when I'm Oneida in Oneida, it's a lot easier of a question. When I'm Oneida outside of Oneida, that looks a lot different. Um, yeah. And I think it forces you into citizenship because you have to be active and you can't rely on the place to give you mm -hmm. um, your identity. And we'll turn it over to Megan. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Hill. Uh, although you may have heard a nickname if you were paying attention due to my father's love of Van Morrison. <laughs> um, I really just want to thank you all for being here and um, coming together and joining us to have a really profound and important conversation about what it means to be a citizen of a native nation and, and what it means to be an indigenous person uh, in this world today. So my hope is that we left you with, with many, many more questions than answers and that you really think more, more deeply about this and, and help us all move forward um, collectively. So I would like to thank the Radcliffe Institute, Sean and Becky. I would like to thank HUNAP and the Harvard Project. Um, and most importantly, I, I'd love to thank our panel here today, Bruce Dutu, Olivia Heft, uh, Tasia Zentik, and Norbert Hill, who's also my father. So join us for a reception, and thank you all for being here.